singing usually see the second set. We're going to see the first set. It's a little bit different. It's very easy to chant set. And uh, you will learn it very quickly. And uh, Pastor Alkay, who's playing today, is really going to help us out uh, to learn it. But very simple. And it's, it's really a beautiful set. Lutherans have been doing it uh, since 1978. How many people know the first set of the A lot of people do, which is great. So sing loud, folks. All right? Has, has, have the people of Zion sung the first set? You know? When I look at the pages of the list, read a little bit of the the first set is completely clean. It's like a brand new book that we ever did. But it'll, it'll really be a, a wonderful addition to it. Uh, the next few seasons. Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, and I think it like So just to be just to be warned about that. So sing along with some of And then finally, uh, the youth group is going Christmas shopping next week. Uh, this is our annual shopping trip where we uh, we buy clothing for children. Uh, and we have, we've been informed about by the elementary school director of the bill. And these are needy children that we uh, need clothes for Christmas. And so we receive offerings from you folks, and then we take those offerings and we go buy them. We've got 10 kids this year for shopping. And so uh, Clara Scott is going to be receiving any offerings that you might have uh, after worship today, and we're going to go shopping uh, next week. So uh, anytime you want to get an offering, that would be great. Uh, it was always a wonderful copy. We bring the uh, presents back, we uh, love pulling back and wrap them. Are there any other answers that we have? If not, then we begin with confession and forgiveness. Please say. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Almighty God, who all hearts are open, all desires are open, come to those secrets are open. Let us the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you. We're the only name of the Lord, the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We have, we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, the truth is not this. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just, forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we are admonished to sin and not for ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us. So that we may be like the Lord, who walk with us, the glory of the Holy Name. Amen. Mighty God, his mercy has given us to die for us. Say God forgives us all our sins. As a call for day minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, and therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Thank you.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit with you all.
those, either the angels of heaven or the Son, but only the Father. But as in the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew, they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this if the owner of the house had known what part of the night the thief was coming, he would stay awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready. The Son of Day is coming at an unexpected hour. The Gospel of the Lord. <laughs>
you know, the, the snooze bar that they put on new alarm clocks are like a net for like 30 years ago. Uh, I always think this electronically enabled procrastination. Right? You may have to get up to keep hitting the, the, the snooze alarm. By the way, you know, they've done studies that say if you hit that snooze alarm about three times, it's not good for you. You're supposed to get up the first time that alarm goes on. That's supposed to be snooze. Uh, I recently read that. A lot of places, especially in cities, um, back before the days of alarm clocks, and this happened during the Industrial Revolution, where people had to head out of factory jobs all the time. In cities, you know, people live in these two, three, four story tenements. They actually hired people for the alarm clocks to come around with really long poles, and you can hire them and tap on your window <laughs> from the outside to wake you up, and they would be tapping until you came to your window and acknowledge. <laughs> I didn't need that. I always had my mom get up. Yeah. So wake up, clean up the world. Wake up is the first one. So Paul tells us we need to do that. That was the moment we were being used So how do you feel when you first wake up in the morning? Okay, good. Run. Where you go? There's an author by the name of Lynn Twist, and she describes the experience that many people have with not waking up. She writes, for me and for so many of us, our first waking thought of the day is, I didn't get enough sleep. And the next one is, I don't have enough time. Whether true or not, that thought of not enough occurs to us automatically before we even think to question or examine. We spend most of our hours and days of our lives hearing, explaining, complaining, and worrying about what we don't have enough of. Before we even sit up in bed, before our feet touch the floor, we're already inadequate, already behind, already losing, already lacking something. By the time we go to bed at night, our minds are racing with the litany of what we didn't get or what we didn't get done next. Go to sleep burdened by those thoughts and wake up to the reverie of lack, this internal condition of scarcity. This mindset of scarcity lives at the very heart of our jealousies, our greed, our prejudice, and our arguments with life. I don't know, does that apply to any of you? I know I wake up in the morning and lose sleep. Or sometimes I think I don't have enough time. But does your mind steer toward lack? Scarcity in first hand. Perhaps you have uh, adopted a better morning attitude. Now, I like the way that C.S. Lewis is uh, one of the greatest Christian apologists of the last century. He describes what happens as we awake. Yes, the problems of life, of life are real, but there is a way to deal with them. This is the way C.S. Lewis says. The real problem of the Christian life comes where people do not usually, usually look for it. It comes the very moment you wake up each morning. All your wishes and hopes for the day rush at you like wild animals. First John each morning consists simply in shoving them all back, listening to that other voice, taking that other point of view, letting that other, larger, stronger, quieter life. So, C.S. Lewis is, of course, talking about letting the voice of God take over our thoughts as we wait. Does that happen to you? So, that would be the way to do it. Yeah, let the voice of God take over. I always say, for these history times, perhaps the best way of doing that is to pray and ask the question when we wake up. Father, what can I do for you today? I do for you today. And this prayer will help you to wake up to what God has in store for you and what God has in store for this world. So you see, according to Paul in his letter to the Romans, you uh, need to wake up. You right? need to wake up well. You need to wake up to the Word of God and the God of our lives. Paul says it will be in the end. Because any time between Jesus' ascension to heaven and his return to us from heaven is called the end times. No one knows how long this period of time will be, but it's all part of the end times. First century Christians initially believed that Jesus would return immediately. When he did, and some who placed him and began to lose a sense of commitment to their faith. So Paul reminded them they were ever nearer to their. Salvation. 
Paul uses night and day not just to illustrate periods of time, but also good and evil. And honestly, isn't playtime and you were always the most worried about your course? Paul says the night is for a and the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of the light. I like that. I get the armor of the light, suggesting that there's some protection seeking to lead in a godly way. Jesus. 
the old things on what Christ wants you to hear, and then you're interested in the old thing with faith. The goal is not to live a perfect, sin free life, but simply to follow Jesus, to become more like him every day. And so the secret of change is not to focus um, your energy on fighting the old but are willing to live. So, in other words, try every day to come to Christ like you do that, then you get a little behaviors behind. Just like in your closet, you put the new clothes on, and they get a little bit more behind. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's it. So, we want to clothe ourselves in the armor of light. New Testament theologian, Bishop N.T. Wright, he gives you very practical ways to put on the armor of light. I know some Christians for their private devotions each day make a conscious effort in prayer to clothe themselves with the very care of Jesus. Some people do this by reading slowly a story from the Gospels and praying that the character of the Jesus they meet there will surround them, protect them, and be the thing that other people see when they meet them. For other people, it's a regular discipline of remembering their baptism. Time when you were plunged into the water as a sign of dying to the side, and brought up out of it as a sign of rising again with him, so that they are no longer living in the old world, but in the new world. So, to put on the Lord Jesus Christ carries the idea of making Jesus a part of everything you see and do. There's a little book called The Bible Through Believers. And in it, Pastor Greg Laurie writes this. Like a comfortable piece of clothing that you wear all day, Jesus wants to join your decision-making process. He wants to be Lord over your sinfulness and your marriage, over your career and free time, over what you hear and watch. By the way you live, you reveal that neither he is Lord of all, nor he is not Lord of all. So that's how we grow up. We invite Jesus Christ to be Lord of our life. The most powerful way to do that is through prayer. When we communicate with the one that we want to become more like, then those changes will come to us. Author Richard Foster wrote a wonderful book on prayer. He says this To pray is to change. Prayer is the central avenue that God uses to transform us. For unwilling to change, Abandoned prayer is a notable characteristic of our lives. The more we pray, the more, the more we come to the heartbeat of God. Prayer starts the communication process between ourselves and God. All the options of life fall before us. At that point, we will either forsake our prayer life and cease to grow, or we will pursue our prayer life. Lots to think about. During the coming weeks of Advent, as we prepare for the arrival of Jesus in Bethlehem, let us also prepare our hearts and minds for his final coming. May we be people who wake up, clean up, and grow up. The light of every day we live is another chance to put away old sins, old ways of living that do not serve our God and neighbor. Shedding those old ways, we are able to put on what is most important the very presence of Jesus. Will guide us into his life. May you have a blessed heaven as you prepare for this coming. Amen. Now, we have a, a very beautiful thing to say. You're going to find it in the blue book in front of you, in the pew, with one voice in it. And it's number 744. It's called Soon, very soon. And as we sing it, there is a little refrain uh, that goes with the first and the second verses. And then, in the third and fourth verses, we also add on to that a lot of hallelujahs. So follow along with me. Thank you. 
Jason and the person that has said this is not fair. I'd like to have Julia Tevitz, Charles Fisher, Pat Hoffman, Tom and Walter Fogel, Linda Murray Reed, John Greenlaw, Linda Nelson, Kevin Herman, Robert Bridges, Ron and Lonnie Gosh, Tom and Jim Snyder, John Lynch, Cameron Park Slocum, Emily Poach, Eric Keller, Aaron Cooney, and Ian Clark. All those we named now. Deliver them to all the departments of their lives in patience and love to those who care for them. Lord, in your mercy. Stir up your power, O Lord, and raise from the shadows of death all who have fallen asleep in you. Help us to comfort those who grieve, especially the families of Judy Bieber, Mark Goss, Mary Ann Hott, and Grace Swanson. Then, by your mercy, bring us all safely into your eternal kingdom. You have prepared for all whom you have redeemed. Lord, in your mercy. And to your hands, O Lord, we can adult when we pray, trusting in your mercy and your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Peace of the Lord. Thank you. 